So, you know, again, with, with me having kind of recordings of, of lectures on here, I don't want to spend a bunch of time going over stuff that's there and available for the people who want it. And then it's, you know, it's not for people who don't want to have to spend all this time with me talking. So I will gladly cover topics if you want me to or specific problems. Scott, I know you'd emailed. Uh, and so I was going to cover that first, um, just jump right into that. Um, and I actually, uh, in your email, so so Laurel and uh, it, Scott had, had emailed about the uh, ethics problem or ethics assignment. Um, and I don't mind, Scott, exactly spelling out the answer I, because I, I don't think the intent of it is working out a, an accounting problem as much as it is. Yeah, I think they're trying to be like, here's a real world problem. How do you handle it type of thing? So I'm going to bring it up. Let me share my screen. Because I was looking at it and um, we have one teacher who sort of outspokenly does not like these uh, ethics problems. Uh, uh, she feels like they're just, uh, I don't know, uh, like confusing, confusing the students and, and, and also not necessarily true to real life, like, um, and, and I don't, I don't fully disagree with her. Um, you know, uh, I'd, I'd probably rather see some type of like critical thinking exercise rather than this because it doesn't feel that ethicsy either. Um, yeah, I feel like it's, it's just like they want to add something, one more thing to do, and it's like it's already a pretty busy class for the most part. It's one more thing to do. Um, I kind of work this problem out, you know, that's, I found this class, if I write everything down, like, okay, so if this is happening, this is happening, I've worked it out, but it was, I was still, because I, ha I have not jumped into the, um, the quiz access and all that yet, so I haven't really done all those, and so maybe if this was next week with that stuff, I probably would nail right. it just like that, but anyways. Uh, and this was actually the, the very comment this teacher made. She said, I feel like it's off a little bit from the material, like it's a little ahead of the material. Yeah, so, exactly. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, and I'm not, you know, I mean, it's fine. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a pretty huge debate actually in, in business education as a whole, like across the nation as to whether it's more valuable to have an ethics course as part of your curriculum or to have an ethics component in every course. Um, and so a lot of programs have both <laughs> because they can't decide. So there's like an ethics component to each course and there's some sort of business ethics course or something you take along the way. Um, I love business ethics. I, I teach it. I'm on an ethics board for the local hospital. And um, I think it's valuable to just sort of think things through and come up with a, a framework for how to think through things so that we can, but uh, you know, this question, I don't know if it hits that mark. So let's just talk about the accounting side of it and then uh, we'll go from there. So we, so here we've purchased equipment for $2 million. Um, it makes you want to say $2 million for some reason. Um, I don't know why. Um, and then in year 10, let's see. So it has a estimated useful life of 10 years. Now in year 10, the company spent an additional million dollars on the equipment. 400,000 was for ordinary repairs. Um, and the other 600,000 was for extraordinary repairs, which consisted of replacing the original engine. Um, so in essence, what we, we probably someone in management said, hey, you know, we could replace this thing or for spending a million bucks, we can get five more years out of it. What should we do, right? That, that, those sorts of decisions happen all the time in business. Um, and they chose to do that. And then it says company management decided to capitalize the entire million dollars. And so, um, you know, so from an accounting standpoint, what's the problem with that? Um, recognize that like a lot of managers you deal with, if they have business degrees, this accounting class and managerial accounting is the only accounting they've ever had. Um, and, and, and that might be some of you uh, at some point, you know, and you'll, you'll be making decisions, be like, oh, I remember something about it. And, and usually what you do is you go to the controller and you say, hey, what are the concerns with, with you know, doing this or, and how do we capitalize this? Um, uh, but every once in a while, you'll get management that are like, nope, we're doing this. And you're like, uh, you can't do that. Um, that's against the law. And so anyway, so, so here's what they want us to do. Write a memo around two paragraphs in length to surprise it explains the following, the accounting error that was made. So first, the accounting error that was made is we should we can only capitalize capital costs. Those are costs that extend the life of the asset. So we should be capitalizing six hundred thousand, right. but the other four hundred thousand would be an expense of the period, right? right. That 
so kind of it's kind of like if you had a car doing oil changes and things like that you would just expense as you do them but if you put a whole new engine in it you would capitalize that or roll that into the cost of the asset so there's the accounting error that that we make uh, the effect, if uncorrected, this error will have on the company's financial statements this year. All right, so um, instead of taking this $400,000 expense, if we capitalize the whole thing, we'll be understating our expense and therefore overstating our net income. I would guess, <laughs> I don't know, but I would guess that might be the driving uh, issue behind this. Uh, if if uh, we've got a big shareholder uh, meeting or our annual meeting coming up and we want to have our net income look high, we don't want to take a $400,000 expense right now. Um, and so they want to spread that expense out of our, um, so so doing this would, would in essence, and it would make, um, yeah, it would just, it, it would make the value of our asset too low on our balance sheet um, because let's see, it would overstate one and understate the other. Right. Asset and equity, right? Um, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, it would make it too high because instead yeah. of capitalizing 600,000, we'd be capitalizing a million. So we'd be making the asset right. look too high. Right. Overstating the asset. Uh, right. And it would be understating the expense and therefore overstating net income. Okay, yeah. Okay. So I got um, that. Okay, good. Go yeah. Ahead. Um. Okay, can you repeat that one more time? Oh yeah, okay. So so what they're asking us to do is in essence roll this whole million dollars into the cost of the asset. That's what they mean by capitalize it. When really only six hundred thousand should be rolled into the cost of the asset, the other four hundred thousand uh, should be an expense right now for this year. So if we do that, if we do the whole million like management's asking us to, okay then we won't be taking that $400,000 expense. So our, um, so our expense will be too low. We'll be understating the expense. And that will make our net income too high. We'll be overstating that income. It'll look like we had more profit than we did. Um, and then the other thing we'd be doing is uh, if we capitalize that whole million, our asset would go up by a million but it should only be going up by 600,000. So we'd be overstating the value of our assets as well. Um, and then the problem that might result is, remember financial statements are used by potential investors who are thinking of buying into the company, potential lenders who are thinking of whether or not they wanna loan us money. And so if our assets look higher than they are, they're making decisions about you know, investing in us or, or, or things like that based on, inaccurate you know a, a company that has fewer assets than it has and if our net income looks higher than it is they might think we're a better investment oh look how profitable they are um and so in almost all cases this makes us look like we're in a stronger position than we are which could lead to bad decision making by external users of that information like lenders and, and investors and internal users like you know we might think man whatever we did this last year made us really profitable when we had a four hundred thousand dollar expense that we didn't claim. So the oh, last yeah. part of this is the part where I feel like it got like it's ahead of what we were kind of doing a little bit, and that's it says the accounting entry needed in year ten to fix the error. And I think where I got stuck was I wasn't sure if Did I'm we, supposed to like do two different entries, and one is you know cash is going to be in both, and one is just like repair expense, and one is like machines you know machinery yeah so i i think it's also unclear did we already make the entry did we already do the million dollar capitalization and now we yeah. have to correct it or are they saying what would what would be the correct entry uh, then see um, i did the latter i did the first in my memo i did it like we they already did it so now i have to correct it and i i think i would accept either honestly because okay. because it's not clear yeah, so I mean, so if if we had already, so if we had already debited the asset a million dollars um, uh, and credited cash a million dollars, I guess, uh, what we would have to do to correct that is we would have to, um, well, there's a couple a couple ways. I think the clearest way is to undo that by doing an entry to just do the exact opposite with opposite, a note that right. says, 
says, you know, we erroneously uh, uh, capitalize this entire expense and then do an entry that in essence debits the equipment, 600,000 credits, repair expense or something like that, maintenance expense, I mean, uh, I mean 400,000 and then credits cash a million. Um, I think you could also get away with, if you had already done the, the, the entry for a million, um, just debiting the asset, I mean, crediting, debiting the, the repair expense 400,000 and crediting the asset 400,000 with a note that explains that, that there was an error and that that's correcting it. But I think it's way clearer to sort of undo the original erroneous entry and then and then do the correct entry. That's good. That's, you're thinking on the same, that's how I, I did it. So, okay, I just wanted to make sure that was right. Um, here's something I would, I. <laughs> This is probably the only thing that I will send back to students for this problem and say, whoa, is I every semester I get students who are like, dear management, you're committing fraud. And I'm like, well, uh, like, be careful before you bring out the F word. You know what I mean? Like, like that'll get you fired, um, especially if they weren't committing fraud and they just made an error um, or if they were committing fraud and didn't like you calling it out in a public way. Um, instead of saying, hey, I noticed this error, um, here's the error, here's what will happen if we don't correct it, um, and the problems that that would lead to, and then here's what we need to do to correct it. Like, now, if if you did that, and then they came back and were like, yeah, noted, thanks, <laughs> and then you sent like a another email that was like, or a, a memo that was slightly more strongly worded, no, like we could be you know, this error could lead to us actually breaking laws. We want to make sure we fix that. And they come back and say, yeah, we, you know, we hear your opinion, but we're not doing it. Then you might say, hey, this, I can't keep working here. If this is how we do business, right? Like, um, anyway, so I just throw that out there for anybody who's listening at home uh, or, or listen to this later. Uh, you don't, don't go straight to accusing people of malfeasance or wrongdoing in these. I mean, the, the um, it's it's mostly honestly it's mostly younger students um, who I think maybe have less work experience and uh, who who do that and and you know I I guess you're bold when you're young or something you just got back from a mission and you want to be right um, um, so that's just one like cautionary I think I would throw out there I mean I've done that at work where I've come out too hard on an issue and then realized it sounded like I was accusing people of wrongdoing when they were acting in good faith, you know, and I've, I, I felt bad about doing that and had to apologize, you know, catch people and say, Hey, I didn't, I know you're an honest person. I just, I just uh, wanted to make sure we know we're doing this the right way. All right. Was that helpful? It was very helpful. Just kind of confirmed what I needed. So I appreciate it. I, I wanted to turn it in and be done with this week, but I wanted to make sure I was doing it right. Okay. Um, Okay, Laurelyn, any any uh, anything you want to look at, or 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 Tammy has to go last because she came last. <laughs> <laughs> I am actually just starting into um, chapter eight, so I feel like I'm a little bit behind Scott. <laughs> I've been working on the chapter eight Spark Smart Book one, I mean part one today, so. Um, I am not sure that I have any questions right now. Um, I think it would have been so helpful to meet before that quiz, the last quiz for chapter seven, but um, I made it through. <laughs> yeah, some of those some of those quizzes are brutal. Because I like I was really trying to memorize some equations and making sure I had things right on the balance sheet. And I was having my kids, you know, quiz me on it. And boy, I still got things wrong that I didn't think I could get wrong, but it's okay. <laughs> I would recommend, remember on the supplementary, supplementary teachings, he has kind of videos from previous semesters that are on there. So say that again, you, Scott. On the supplementary teaching tab, if you go to that, there's like videos for each of the weeks. Yeah, I think he's gonna show you. So I, I use those before I start into anything. And then a lot of times when I come to Thursday night, it's kind of a, the same thing again. So I get it twice, which is helpful. Oh yeah, 
yeah. yeah. I don't know why I didn't even remember that. Yeah. yeah. So in the weeks we don't meet, you should look for possible videos there. You know, I have looked at those videos almost every week, except I don't, I don't think I did it for chapter seven. <laughs> I will look at chapter eight before I keep going. <laughs> Well, and, and, us, and, and usually the harder the chapter, the more quiz access, access problems are there because people have bugged me about them over the years, right? Um, and then I have to keep an eye on them, make sure we don't they don't update them because then people are looking at them and even more confused. Um, good point. Thanks for that reminder. That's that's a good reminder. It's there. I know people keep using those. I'm gonna have to put up a paywall or something, you know, like fifty cents to watch or something. Oh, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Especially since I use copyrighted material to make it, you know, so I can't really. I, yeah, I don't think that would work. Um, Tam, Tammy, any any questions or any any problems you want to look at or or go over specifically? I'm just starting chapter eight. Also, I was up, you know, as you know from my email until middle of the night trying to get that stupid quiz done because it was killing me. Just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification because I'm like. I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I did. <laughs> I didn't understand. I didn't know the month thing. That'd be a good thing to put in your little video thing. Yeah, that, yeah, and that's you know, what's hard about it is like it used to be like this big point of like um, I don't know, like some some textbooks make a big deal out of calculating the days, so it's like they want to they like have all these problems, and this one's kind of in the middle of that, you know. You know, so you're sitting, you're trying to do days, which seems reasonable. It's telling you it goes from April 1st to October 30 or whatever it was. And, and you're trying to calculate how many days will be in that. And then when you look at their answer key, they're like, I think it was April to December 31st. Right. You know, they're just doing nine twelfths because it's nine months out of, out of a year. Um, and, and so what's challenging about that is in real life, like we never do that. Like I, I, I just put in the dates and hit calculate and it'll tell me, you know, I don't have to be like, do I count the first day of the note, but not the last day of the note? And are we doing a, are we doing a 360 day convention or a 365 day convention? Um, I think nobody does that. Um, again, what they want you to make sure you can do is calculate, you know, interest, principal times rate times time, but we get hung up sometimes on like, oh, okay, I, I, I know what you want. And I understand the formula, but do you want me to do days or 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 months uh, for time? Um, in, you know, nine months out of twelve, or two hundred and seventy-five days out of three hundred and sixty, or whatever. Yeah, Siri was super tired of me asking how many days were between April first and December thirty-first because I'm like, obviously, I'm not doing something right. I didn't know Siri could do that. That's pretty cool. Does right. she does? <laughs> but then it's nine twelves. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, I would okay. So um, I'm looking at like if you can do like an overview of eight, what we're looking for, so I kind of have an idea. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, Tammy, I think that is another example of how Mifflin loves to throw us a curveball, yeah. something we've never done, and ta-da, it's in the quiz. Nine twelve. What? But you do. Yeah. You can use your books, right? I mean. Yeah, I didn't see it in my book. Until you get to the test. Yeah, but I'm saying on the quiz. On the quiz. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, so I. I don't want to go through this whole big honker of a PowerPoint over here. So it's like, that's the technical term. It's a big honker. It's got 29 slides. That's better than the 90 the publisher put into it. But, um, but maybe some, you know, some points. If you um, could, maybe if I, if I could just make a suggestion, the double declining methods, can you uh -huh. cover that one just real quick? Yeah. So, well, so let me just ask, do we feel comfortable with what a plant asset is? That it's pretty much buildings, equipment, stuff like that. They, like, I like that part was kind of review from right. another chapter we've done before. Right, right. Well, yeah, we've already been talking about assets. I think the new stuff would be like land improvements uh, because land can't depreciate, but land improvements can. So when you put curbing and parking lots and stuff like that, uh, those things, so you have to actually track them separately. Um, um, so let's let's go to the depreciation methods. So um, like Scott was, you know, straight line is is pretty pretty simple in that it's what we've already been doing when we've looked at that for our adjusting entries. We just take the cost of the asset minus its salvage value divided by its useful life, and then you that tells you how much you're going to depreciate. 
-hmm. and, and units of production is really similar in that it's the cost minus the salvage value, but you divide it by the total units of production. And all that means is the number of units in the in the asset's useful life. So if it's a vehicle, it might be how many miles we expect to have in its useful life. If I'm a farmer, I might say a truck has 200,000 miles in its useful life. If I'm a rental car company, maybe my cars only have 50,000 or 40,000 in their useful life before I'm gonna auction them off because I always wanna keep newer cars. So it really is determined by the business, you know, what useful life is. Um, and so then to find appreciation, you just say like, well, how many miles did we drive it times this rate we calculated um, and that's how you do depreciation. Um, for some assets, that really makes more sense, right? An equipment, piece of equipment that does, you know, every run, it has a counter, or how many miles, or like tractors, or every hour, you know, the number of hours they run. So, so then Scott was asking about, or asked me to review the declining balance method. So this is what's called an accelerated, um, an accelerated depreciation method. Um, and this recognizes that with many assets, we we use up more of their cost in the early years than in the in, in later years, so that that balance declines quickly. Uh, you know, you even hear with like a car, right? The minute you drive it off the lot, it's it's worth way less. You can't ever sell it for, you know, for as much as you paid for it. Um, so so the process is a little bit different for the declining balance method and the end you have th these three steps are really good steps like to this day i still use them um, even though again software does most of the heavy lifting so the first step is that we calculate the straight line rate and so the straight line rate is calculated just by taking 100 percent and dividing it by the assets useful life so like this asset has five years in its useful life so I would take 100% divided by five. And that means the straight line rate, if I were if I were doing straight line depreciation is I would depreciate the asset 20% of its cost per year. So that's step one. Then with double declining balance, I'm gonna take double that straight line rate or, or you know, and there are other types of declining balance methods. Sometimes they have 1.5 times declining balance or uh, so, but it's the same idea. So, so my straight line rate, times two, because I'm doubling it, is 40%. So that's going to become my depreciation rate. But unlike straight line, right, where I calculate the amount of depreciation that happens at the beginning and then use the same amount each year, here I'm going to recalculate it uh, on the balance, the book value or the balance of the asset. So that's what it means by declining balance, okay, is that so our depreciation expense is going to be our double declining balance rate times the beginning of the period book value. Okay, book value is defined as our cost minus our accumulated depreciation. Okay, so let me step you through this um, schedule. So in the year we purchased the asset, the book value is what we paid for it because there's no accumulated depreciation, $10,000. Uh, where, where, where I kept missing this in the smart book was I kept taking the salvage value out of it. Right. And so with straight line and units of production, we subtract out salvage value, but we don't do that with the double declining balance method. Instead, what we're going to do is at the very end, we're going to take an amount of depreciation necessary to leave us with our salvage value. So we just use our book value, which is our cost minus accumulated depreciation. So at the beginning of 2020, our book value was $10,000. Multiply that by that double declining balance rate, which gives us the depreciation expense. Our accumulated depreciation is any previous accumulated depreciation plus this year's, so zero plus 4,000 is 4,000. And our book value is our cost minus the accumulated depreciation or $6,000. But then to go to the next year, you just take that 6,000 times 40. Okay, so you don't have to do the three steps every single time once you started nope. it. Yeah, because because right. the ending book value of one period is the beginning book value of the next period. Multiply that by 40%. That gives us the expense for that year. So then our accumulated depreciation is the previous year's accumulated plus this year's depreciation. Okay. And, then 10, and so forth. Um, and we do that each year. And then in the last year, this is where it's a little tricky. Um, 
we have the beginning of, we don't the beginning of the year book value we don't worry about the rate for this last year instead we say well how much is my my salvage value need to be at the end i'm just going to take enough depreciation expense in that last year to leave us with the desired salvage value this looks like the perfect problem that will be like a fill in the problem on the exam or the quiz one of the two or something yep. like that yeah, and if you if you're not pretty familiar with it, it will beat you up and take your lunch money, right? Like it's mm -hmm. it's it's kind of mean. Um, anyway, but it, once you get used to it, it's not, you know, it's pretty easy. But at first, it's because it's pretty different than the other two. So real quick, then on that, so I do need to remember the th the salvage value at the end on this. Then, mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So straight line, units of production, salvage value at the beginning, double declining balance, it's at the end. Okay. Tricky, tricky, but that makes more sense than just reading it in the book or the way they were explaining it in the smart book. So thank you. Let's see. Other things that they will try to catch you on are things like partial year depreciation. Right, so they're going to purchase the asset in, on April first, uh, and then in that first year, and they're not going to say anything else about it other than it was purchased on April first. Here's the cost. Here's the salvage value. What's the first year's depreciation? And you're going to have to catch that it's going to only be nine twelfths of the amount that it would be for a full year. So, like that's important. Like, like there will be a. I, that that's a, a standard tricky way, right? Is to is to, you know, instead of telling you, okay, you're doing a partial year here, they just give you the info and you're supposed to figure that out. Um, let's see. Um, this is kind of what the the uh, um, what the uh, ethics problem sort of hinged on this idea of additional expenditures. It can be broken into two types, revenue expenditures and capital expenditures. Just, you know, just remember that revenue expenditures don't increase the asset's life or its capabilities. Um, so like maintenance, the idea is that, and people will argue that maintenance does extend something's life, but maintenance actually allows it to live to, to, the, to the normal life it's supposed to live, right? Doing your oil change on your car doesn't really extend its life. It's what it takes for the car to last as long as it should last. Um, and so don't like, don't like get too, you know, too tricky about it. Just recognize that, you know, regular maintenance is considered a revenue expenditure, something that we just take an expense for during this period. Um, capital expenditures provide benefits for longer than the current period. So if they're, and they, and they add to the value of the asset in some way. So something like putting a new motor in, a, in an equipped piece of equipment or adding a wing onto a building, that might not make the building last longer, but it will certainly add value to the asset in a way that would allow it to be used more, right? So anyway, there's a couple of examples, I guess, or not examples, but identifying characteristics. Um, and just recognize that like, like revenue expenditures are almost always, well, not almost always, they are always a debit to an expense and a credit to either cash or accounts payable, depending on if you're paying cash for it, you're gonna pay for it later. Whereas improvements or, or capital expenditures are always a debit to an asset because we're increasing the value of the asset and a credit to cash or a payable. So that's really the only difference. One's an expense, the other increases the asset. And then let me walk through one more thing, one, one more process that I think is important. And that is how do we dispose of plant assets? Um, and dis dispose is like a scary sounding word. It sounds like we crumpled it up and threw it away. That could mean that we did just trash it or it could mean that we sold it. Okay, so disposal is just means getting rid of an asset. Um, so this, th there's a couple steps. And the first step is that you have to update the depreciation to the date of disposal. And this is another one where they get people on these problems. Because in essence, what you're doing is, is if I sell this, you know, if, if I sell this asset on August 1st, 
um, or, or let's say July 31st, the end of July. Um, probably the last time I've recorded depreciation on the asset was December 31st of the previous year. Okay, typically we just do one adjusting entry at the end of each year to record uh, depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation. And so if I sell it on July 31st, I've got to make sure that appreciation, accumulated appreciation account is up to date at the time of, this, of the disposal of the asset and that I've taken all the depreciation expense that I should for this year. So I have to, you know, if, if it was July 31st, um, that's going to be seven months, right? So I'm going to take my normal dep annual depreciation, multiply that by seven twelfths, and then I'll debit depreciation expense and credit accumulated depreciation. I have to do that because now to do my closing entry or my, my sale entry, when I dispose of an asset, what I want to do is get the asset off of my books. So I want the asset account to be have a zero balance, and I want its accumulated depreciation account to have a zero balance uh, because I no longer have the asset. So I have to, you know, since I'm going to be getting rid of accumulated depreciation, it's got to be right. So I've got to update depreciation to, to the date of disposal. Then this is how I journalize the disposal. And, and I'll tell you, and I'll show you how I do it um, that makes it easier for me, but it may not be for you. First, if I receive cash, I'll record that. So if I receive cash, you know, someone pays me for it, I'm selling the asset to them, that would be a debit to cash. Sometimes you have to pay to dispose of something, right? Pay someone to haul it off or something. Um, and so then you would credit your cash. I would, I would also remove the accumulated depreciation account, which will have a credit balance. So to remove it, I will debit the full balance of the accumulated depreciation account. And I have to remove the asset account, which will have a debit balance. So I'll have to credit the full amount of that, of that asset account. So after I've done these three things, either my debits and credits can balance, and so I'm good. That would mean that I'm disposing of an asset for exactly what its book value is, not making a gain or a loss. Or the debits and credits don't balance after I've done any cash received or paid, accumulated depreciation, and the asset. And if they don't balance, then I'm going to have I'm going to have either made a gain or had a loss on the asset. And so what I always remember is if, if I have to do an entry on the credit side to make it all balance, that means I had a gain. And I remember that because it's actually a revenue, right? A special revenue for selling an asset, which we increase revenues with credits. And then if I have to do an entry on the debit side to make it all balance, then it was an expense. So that would be a loss. And so that's my process. So I'll show you a couple of examples. So here's a fully depreciated asset. That's pretty easy. Cost 9,000, has accumulated depreciation of 9,000, and we're just discarding it. So no salvage value, nothing. So then we just debit the asset. Uh, I'm sorry, we debit the accumulated depreciation account because it had a credit balance of 9,000. So we debit that, uh, that 9,000, and now the accumulated depreciation account is gone, and we credit the asset account. It would have had a debit balance of 9,000, we credit at 9,000 and that effectively takes it off our books, right? And we could put a note discarding a fully depreciated asset or whatever. So there's the simplest form. Here, if we have an asset that is not fully depreciated, um, then the first thing we have to do is recording depreciation at the time of discarding it. So you can see that it cost 8,000, has accumulated depreciation of 6,000. Company uses straight line depreciation over eight years with zero salvage value. So 8,000 divided by eight means I'm doing $1,000 in depreciation per year. Um, and so if I'm selling it on July 1st, I would say, okay, that's six months. So 1,000 times 6 twelfths would be my depreciation expense up to the date of sale. So I'll debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. Um, and then if my accumulated depreciation account had a balance of 6,000, and now I've just credited that account another 500, it now has a balance of 6,500. So to sell it, I'm gonna debit accumulated depreciation, which will take that account to zero. And I'm gonna credit the equipment account. 
And so again, this is where I say, but I do those first. And then I say, well, did I have a loss or a gain? And so I'll say, well, I had 8,000 on the credit side and 6,500 on the debit side. I'm gonna have to do 1500 debit in order to make this thing balance, to have 8,000 on both sides. And since I debited that, where expenses go, okay, then I know that's a loss. That's my process. Um, if I'd had to credit in order to make it all balance, that would have been a gain. Couple more, and then we'll be done. I know I promised I wouldn't do a big lecture thing, but I, this is a confusing part of the chapter that I think it's glossed over sometimes. Um, so, okay, I'm go. glad. Um, so here we sell some equipment originally cost 16,000, has accumulated depreciation of 12,000 uh, at December 31st of the prior year. They use straight line depreciation at 4,000 per year. That was nice for them to tell us how much they do per year. Uh, and they sold it for 3,000 cash. So the first thing I have to do, bring my depreciation up to the date of sale. If they do 4,000 a year, and they did it on March 31st. I'll do 4,000 times 3 twelfths to get $1,000. Debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation. My accumulated depreciation account had a balance of 12,000. I just credited it 1,000 more, whoa, 1,000 more, uh, which means it now has a balance of 13,000. So now I know that I got 3,000 in cash, so I debit cash 3,000. I know that my Accumulated depreciation account has a credit balance of 13. So I'm going to debit that 13,000, take it to zero. Um, and then my equipment account had a, a balance of 16,000 on the debit side. So I'm going to credit that to take it to zero. And I can see in this case, I'm in balance, right? I've got 16,000 on the debit side, 16,000 on the credit side, which means in essence, I sold it for its its actually its its book value, it had a book value of three thousand. I sold it for three thousand, so I'm at a break even, no gain, no loss. All right. Here I saw one for above book value. Same thing. Bring my depreciation up to date. I'm going to debit the amount of cash I got, which was seven thousand. I'm going to debit the accumulated depreciation, which was twelve thousand plus the thousand I did when I brought it up to date. I'm going to credit the equipment account, its balance of 16,000. In this case, before I have that 4,000 added, you'll see I have 20,000 on the debit side and 16,000 on the credit side, which means I'm going to have to add $4,000 to the credit side to make this whole thing balance. And since I'm crediting it, that will be a gain. Okay. And same idea here, we sell one for below. We bring our depreciation up to, up to the date. We debit the amount of cash we got. We debit the accumulated depreciation balance. We credit the asset balance. And then we add them up. I've got 15.5 on the debit side, 16,000 on the credit side. So I'm gonna have to debit another 500. And since it's on the debit side, it's a loss on that one. So that's my process. Other people, they prefer to like actually um, say, okay, asset minus accumulated depreciation gives me a book value of $3,000. How much cash did I get? 2,500. So I had a loss of 500 and then create the journal entry. If that works better for your brain, then that that's good too. Um, anyway. What well, works better for my brain, I hope all the quiz and exam questions are all straight line depreciation on all those questions. <laughs> Usually when they're doing these like selling plan assets, they are because they're trying to focus on that, you know. Um, and like these, you know, it's, it tells you even how much depreciation they're doing per year, which makes it easy. Um, all right, well, uh, any other questions? Are we good for tonight? Seems like we covered a lot of ground actually for, uh, maybe it's easy when there's only, only like a few of us. Um, we know what I hate about Zoom is I'm always looking at your guys' pictures and then it looks like I'm not looking at you. So you have to like look at the camera and then I'm not looking at you or look at you, but then it looks like I'm not looking at you. So there you go. <laughs> uh, the, the, the modern era. Thanks for going over these. I know they're going to be super helpful when I get that far. <laughs> so no, and, thank you. <laughs> and, you know, and there is a video of this too. If you, if you, you know, I think in my, 
I wasn't sure when you went to it, right after I said that you went to it, maybe there wasn't a video for this. Week. Yeah, well, that's what I just was thinking too. But I can I can throw something on there because I actually I'm teaching accounting 101 for Ensign this semester and like there it's a week off and I just put together some videos for them for this. So if they're not, I'll just I'll just add those links in there. Um, um, I'll check it out and make sure. Okay, well, all right, well, let's let's uh let's have a prayer. It can't it can't be Scott? And so that leaves three of us. Uh, I mean, it could be, but it's on it's non-standard. I don't mind, Brother Fox. Okay, great. <laughs> Our dear friend Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we could meet tonight and to learn some more from brother fox and we could go over some things that are a little bit tricky we pray that as we move forward with our assignments this week that we can remember the things we've learned tonight and that we'll have it to look back on and refer to later and we're grateful that um we we have this way of, of learning things in case that the other way doesn't make sense and we're, we're grateful for um sometimes the real world experiences that also help us understand it better we're grateful father that um, brother fox is able to get some time um out of his time with his family and pray that his family will be blessed for um his his dedication and we bless, ask a blessing on those who couldn't meet with us tonight that they can find the, the help that they need and be supported in the assignments as they work through them as well. And we ask for thy spirit to be with us tonight and say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, my granddaughters are coming tonight. So I'm excited about that. Our our second to youngest son is getting his endowments on Saturday, getting ready to leave on a mission. And so we have oh everybody coming in and it's exciting. Um, we have eight kids. So this is our seventh kid. Um, and he's a, it, I won't say it's getting old hat, but kind of like you're like, you know, it's, it, it is different than like when your first kid goes to the temple or goes on a mission. Or you're kind of like, yeah, we took some pictures of you. It was good. Uh, or whatever. Um, Where's he going? He's going to Brazil. Wow. That's yeah, exciting. We, we've been trying yeah. to learn some Portuguese and it's, <laughs> it's not as different than Spanish, but it's a lot the same. I, I was going to say, if you get a chance, I know you're busy, but in this week's Come Follow Me, there is a talk by Elder Christofferson, a BYU devotional. So it's kind of long, like 30 minutes, but it's pretty wonderful. So I don't know if, if you have time, what's nice about talks is you can put them on, listen to them while you're doing other stuff. That's uh, exactly like, what I do. I listen to them. <laughs> but then you're like, did I give that the attention? Anyway, it was really awesome. I listened to it last night and I was just totally nothing to do with the rest of the lesson. Just, just, I just, it had an impact on me. So anyway, have a great Thanks. night. Happy for you. Yeah. Yes. Bye bye. Enjoy your grandbabies. I will. <laughs> Fireworks are way better with a four year old. Yes. Have a Sometimes. Life. As well, long like, as they're not afraid. Well, that's true. But like the, the wonder, like for me, it's like, oh, yeah, fire, you know, great. But to like a little one, they're like, ooh, it's so cool. Well, I yeah. have, I have a, a, a two, a two year old, and uh, uh, they're about to turn three and one. So I don't know that the one-year-old's going to have any interest <laughs> at all, yeah. besides scared. So. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> all right. Have a great ha night. You Thanks. too. Bye-bye.